with physical pain, with a heavy heart, with a deep burden, and also with much hope all together. Um, we go to the next slide, I believe. Why do I have a heavy heart? <clears throat> I mean, just sitting back and just thinking about our world. I mean, most of us live in North Carolina or somewhere in the United States. And you know, this slide was made by <clears throat> Answers in Genesis back in the early 2002. That's like 20 years ago. And these are the same things we're dealing with today. We, we see the brokenness of this world in abortion, in homosexuality, in different forms of humanism, racism, euthanasia, divorce, pornography. Every one of those, and there's many more. You can just make a whole bunch more balloons. All, all of these, I'll call them fruits or symptoms, go back to the fact that some way and somehow we're out of line with our Creator. Um, we're out of line with our foundation. Um, we sung a song earlier <clears throat> that talked about building our lives upon God's love. If I were to quantify that a little bit further, God's love and His truth together. Um, but we, we have fallout. We have brokenness because we lack the wrong, we, we lack the right foundation. We've built... <clears throat> Our lives in something else in God's word and His truth, and so we're we're reaping um, the consequences here and now. We have bad fruit, and we have symptoms of people who are lost and do not have a solid foundation. Um, I'm also deeply burdened. Um, I'm de- deeply burdened for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of it has to do. With we, we don't know our origins, um, and that's why, like, that's why I am so committed um, to teach God's word, to go through Genesis as slow as we are, because we need to know our origins. We we have definitely, as a nation, have forgotten um, our Creator and where we have come from, and so I believe there's much truth decay in this world, and we need more. <coughs> Truth, um, to fill our minds, to fill our truth, um, <coughs> fill, our, fill our minds with God's truth. I mean, I, I think of this really simple thing. We don't need CRT to understand race. We just need Genesis 1. If you understand Genesis 1, we understand there's one race. and You understand the problems in the race, and you also understand the solution. All of Genesis 1. It's, I'm not trying to oversimplify um, some people say, Gary, we, we need CRT so we can understand the fact that there are people that are broken and disadvantaged. If you have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ, you will care about those who are disadvantaged, those who are broken. And you, you will hate those who are being taken advantage. Or <coughs> and so you don't need, you don't need um, CRT for that. The scripture alone is enough to tell us that we are to live according to God's dictates and God's will. And, yes, care about people that are broken, hurting, lost, in need. God, God's truth, without a doubt, is the answer for the world today. And so um, we are on the second half of day six of the creation week. I really, I'm really, really going to be able to highlight the main things, to be honest with you. I probably studied hundreds of hours on this topic since becoming a Christian. I'm just really giving you the highlights, the main things to know about. Um, I really would want to teach on this probably for the rest of the year, but I will point you to websites, resources. Uh, I'll probably bring a box of them in the near future and just let you borrow them. Um, my family's gone through most of them. Many times we've gone long trips and dad just throws in the DVD and we watch creation stuff, because um, that's the only way we can get it in, or we could probably get it in other ways. But I want to say, in light of a heavy heart and a deep burden, we have much hope in the gospel. We have much hope in the gospel, for it is the answer for us today. And it all begins with Genesis, going back to our Creator. And as we do that, we will know who we are, and we also will know what our purpose is and so this morning, um, we're going <clears throat> to look at how God, our holy God, has given his divine command. He has spoken, and he has spoken <clears throat> in the creation week, the heavens and the earth. He has made um, the plants, the water, the air, the perfect place 
for us to live in and thrive in. And also, he's made an amazing sky that we could be amazed of God's handiwork as we look and see the stars, the heavens, the planets, and other solar systems. And so, as we look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, that Amy read earlier, <clears throat> we're basically coming to the climax, or the crowning jewel, the peak of the creation week, where God is going to make mankind in his image, male and female. Another way we can look at this, we're going to basically study biblical anthropology. Biblical anthropology for God's glory. So in this passage, I see at least six created purposes. And each of these six created purposes, for the most part, really address something in our world today in a profound way. And you'll find like what the scripture said is one thing and how our world lives today, in many ways, is another whole different paradigm because they are so lost. They've drifted so far from God's original purposes. So six creative purposes coming right at you. Um, <clears throat> we're created to mirror God's image, I'm created to manage God's creation, created to be male and female equally, uniquely, and completely, created <clears throat> to be blessed by God, created to multiply and subdue, and created to, excuse me, created to be just so and very good. So if we want to know how life works and if you are an Apple fan, which I am, um, you may have all these kind of Apple products. Um, when your products go bad, you know, you don't go to, what's the competitor? My brain. It starts with A, Android, right? My brain worked now. Um, <coughs> you don't go to Android, right, for your answers for your Apple products. You go to Apple Care or Apple Instructions, Apple Manual, because they know best how their functions, how the products work. So likewise, when life isn't working, um, when there's problems in, in, in society and government, in your home, in your marriage, raising kids and so forth, it works best when you go to the Creator, God Himself and His book for this life. It's that simple. But we have strayed, and I want to bring us right back <coughs> to God's purposes and his creative design. So the first one is <clears throat> this, creative purpose number one. We are created to mirror God's image. This is probably the longest point, and it's the, probably the best point. Moses writes, Holy Spirit spoke to Moses. Moses pinned this down, the whole Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. And <clears throat> he says here in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and in his image, God created, in his image, in the image of God, he created them. So, who created man? It's kind of a strange question. We'll first say God, but if you look at the pronouns, you see us, and our, twice, and his own. So you see these pronouns, and these pronouns refer to let's think, it refers to the whole trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working together, all involved personally, directly, and intimately, and creatively to make God, <coughs> excuse me, to make man and woman in the likeness and image of God. Um, <coughs> I believe that all these pronouns are there for a reason, all four of them, to make the point clearly and forcefully with, with emphasis, emphasis, emphatically. Um, it wasn't a creative process of evolution. It wasn't like God wound it up and let it go. That's theistic evolution. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made us in His image. Not in the image of amino acids or monkeys or apes or anything like that. In the image of God is how God made humans. And this is good to know because if we were an accident or product of a Big Bang, you would have no dignity, value, worth, or purpose. But the very fact that God made you um, in his image, we have divine value, worth, and purpose. This is a big deal. If, if I was an accident, I mean, go ahead, live, drink, and be merry, and surely you will die. But because we have purpose, it changes everything. Um, you don't need to live life to earn or gain purpose. 
through your degrees or through your status or whatever. God literally grants you dignity, infinite worth and value, and the fact that he made you in his image. And he gives you the ultimate purpose, to enjoy him and to glorify him. That's it. In this passage, it just says nothing about involving over millions and billions of years with a bunch of mutations and accidents. This is not there in the scripture. What God does, he literally stamps you divinely with his identity as an image bearer of God in his likeness. So what does it mean as we think through his likeness or his image? Um, I believe I have a quote here by John MacArthur. The Hebrew word for image, teslim, comes from the root that speaks of carving. It is the same word used to speak of graven images in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. It also seems to convey the idea that man was carved into the shape or into the image of God. It suggests that God was, in essence, the pattern for the personhood of man. I love that. If that is not true of anything else in, <clears throat> in the space-time universe, it's only true that God made us, human beings, in his image. That is not true for any other thing that's made in the entire universe. It's made by, created, created by God, but not necessarily in God's image. Other things, except for God's crowning jewel on day six, human beings, men and women. So what does it mean to mirror and display and to bear and reflect God's image? This is a big money question. Um, we understand when God made us, he made us in his perfect image. We know... <coughs> Um, theologians t have two ways they describe the attributes of God, the communicable attributes of God and the incommunicable attributes of God. So <clears throat> when we talk about bearing the image of God or displaying the image of God or the point I made today, mirroring the image of God, we're talking about <clears throat> displaying his communicable attributes. And let me give you an idea. Communicable attributes are things that God has given us that... Um, are perfect with God, and in, in one sense, we have an aspect or evidence of these communicable attributes in us. And I'll give you some examples. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, we know that God is love, and human, have, human beings have a capacity to love. We don't do it perfectly, but we have a capacity to love. God is just. Um, social justice is a very popular concept, term, and practices these days. Human beings, we all have a sense of right and wrong and justice. We don't carry it out perfectly, but God has built that in us as image bearers. Um, God is the creator. Um, human beings create. We create buildings. Some of us create art, songs, and so forth. But we don't create things ex nihilo. We don't create out of nothing. We, it was so funny. I was watching a YouTube video. And Katy Perry accuses someone else of taking her song and changing it up with her own words and style. But she goes, that's my song. Did you copy me? I thought it was so funny. But anyways, um, but we don't get anything new. We just, you know, make own renditions or take a little bit of this and borrow a little bit of hair. Really, no one makes anything totally new. No human beings. We borrow, adapt. No one's a total original pr person. Um, the other, other common attributes of God are things like mercy, attributes like mercy, goodness, kindness, truthfulness. Um, we have a sense of rationality with us. And more than anything, we, we are relational. Um, we, we have a capacity to have a relationship um, with each other. But particularly, God made us that we might have a relationship with him. I mean, in contrast, incommunicable attributes that human beings, we cannot um, reflect are these type of attributes, um, the fact that God is transcendent or immutable or self-existence. Um, that part, we, we, we don't bear that part of God's image. We bear the communicable attributes of God. And so I want to break this down further. Um, really, what we're talking about as we talk about being an uh, image bearer or living the, out the likeness of God, in one sense, the mission of Rooted Church is simply, if I were to put two words is it for it, would be we are called to be image bearers. That's it. Image bearers. And we're just, I'll just kind of tease it out like this. 
We are image bearers as we enjoy God. We enjoy the gospel. Um, <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we see that God has given us the ultimate purpose to enjoy Him. To enjoy Him. We do so individually. We do so corporately. And in, <clears throat> in this amazing verse, is probably... One of my top verses, probably top three, um, 2 Corinthians verse three eighteen says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. As you look and see the glory of the Lord, you're being transformed into the same image from one, <coughs> one degree of glory to another. So as you open God's Word daily, week in and week out, come and experience fellowship. In one sense, we are beholding the glory of the Lord. As we do that more and more, a little bit at a time, guess what? We are being transformed. I mean, I look at some of like the older guys in this room, guys a little bit older than me. I wonder what you guys were like, you know, 20 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, you're, you may be used to your degree of sanctification, but you're probably a crazy dude prior to Christ. You probably were lost as lost can be. But we, we see a person that's somewhat sanctified where you've been beholding the Lord for a while and there's 20 or 30 years of sanctification in you. But some of you guys are younger. You guys even see an even younger degree. I, you're maybe, say, four or five years and you see the progress the Lord has granted you in His kindness as you've looked to Him week in and week out. Paul says this, For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, who's working Christ in you to literally transform you in the image of Jesus Christ so that you what? May be bearer, image bearers. The second one is the second point of our mission state of Rooted Church is that we, we, our hope is that you would be equipped by mirroring the gospel, that you would be image bearers in action and attitude. Um, my hope as you grow in Christ and bear his image as you relate to one another, that we would bear the image of Christ. As children relate to the parents, that we would bear the image of Christ. As parents relate to their children, that we would bear the image of Christ. It goes both ways. Um, to our grandparents, to our great-grandparents, to our siblings, that we would bear image of Christ to each other, that we'd be Christ to each other, to our co-workers, teammates, classmates. When a rude car driver cuts you off, that you would bear the image of Christ. Um, to them. Um, maybe they didn't cut you out, off accidentally, um, and it was an accident. Or maybe they did, and they just need Christ because they're out of control for one reason or another. Or you don't appreciate the customer service you received. In response, you're still called to be an image bearer to that waiter or waitress or customer service person, to guest new people that like you just don't know. You're called to be an image bearer to that person. And I want to say this super loudly. To those of different ethnic groups, we are called to be image bearers. I remember, I think in sociology class, I think I, I came across this term, ethnocentricity. You guys come up with that word? It's basically the idea that my ethnic group is better or superior than anyone else's. We have this kind of pride, this arrogance. I want you to know that is pride and that's arrogance that we have that. If you, in light of the gospel, it crushes this pride and crushes this arrogance and reminds us that we are what? One family, we are one race, and we are redeemed by the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And so, hence, the gospel and Jesus Christ is the answer for this world. And it's not CRT. I'm so sorry. It's not CRT. And I keep coming back to it because some people keep thinking it is. And it just isn't. Um, a person who embraces the gospel will do and pursue much more greater graces, purposes in pursuing living out Christ for those around them as they embrace the gospel. And let's engage the third aspect of our mission. Let's mirror the, the gospel beyond the walls here. Um, let's <clears throat> mirror the gospel together. 
and kindness and grace and hospitality and blessing our neighbors. But Christmas presents don't need to just go to each other and your family and your church. Bless your neighbors. Be kind to your neighbors. Um, in the smallest, littlest way, some of you guys know, I'm not just a pastor, but I happen to be now a president of our local association. And so, great. Now the association is looking at me, and I have an opportunity to engage and to relate and to be a blessing to our little association. I mean, I have enough to do. I don't need this. But, you know, we got to do it, and it's a simple way to serve our neighbor. So, yes, in a couple weeks, I have a meeting with the VP, the secretary, and I'm our treasurer, and I'm going to do so with joy, and I want to be a blessing to them and be an encouragement to them because we have an opportunity to serve our neighborhood, and I want to bring back the block parties so that we can have parties together and invite you guys to meet my neighbors too. Okay, that's one long message. Um, so point number two, create a purpose. Number two, we are created to manage God's creation. This is also known as the cultural mandate. Um, Christians in the Presbyterian circles are probably more familiar with this term than our Baptist circles, which is okay. Look it up online. Cultural mandate is fascinating. Um, it's right up there with the Great Commission in many ways. But in verse 26, it says here that God has given us this amazing purpose. And it impacts the way you mother, the way you father, what kind of student you are, how you work in the workplace, how you live in the community. Verse 26 says this, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air in the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over, <clears throat> and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We have a responsibility, what? Simply to make our world better for God's glory. And there's some practical things that um, God calls out to Adam in, in, in Genesis chapter 2, 19. The first step here, um, God <coughs> called Adam to basically name all the creatures. Just give them all a name. Um, some people have said this joke. I don't know if it's encouraging or not. But Adam was called here. Eve, Eve was made later on on this day, I believe, in, gen, in day six. Um, some people have said if Eve was there, it would have took too long, so Adam did it. I don't know if that's the case, but it's a silly joke. The commentary said that, all right? I just blame the commentary. Um, but it would have taken longer, two people. But now God was tasked with this particular task. I mean, Adam was, and then Eve came into the picture later on that day, and they're both tasked with what? Caring for the whole world, managing the whole world that God has made them. A beautiful world at that time known as the Garden of Eden. Um, we see in Genesis 2.15 that the Lord took the man and put him in the garden to, what, tend and keep it. So he had two responsibilities there, to tend and keep it. I believe at this time, pre-fall, it wasn't that difficult. You have a perfect environment, all the animals are getting along, all the humans are getting along. It would have been such a joy to take care of this amazing garden. Post-fall, guess what? It gets much harder, far more difficult. Um, so that's, that's your the second purpose. We have, a, we have a calling, a creative purpose. What? To live out the cultural mandate. Um, <clears throat> to lead it, to care for it, to tend, to tend it. Um, point number three, or creative purpose number three. We see that we are created to be male, female, equally, uniquely and completely. Um, and we see that in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27b. And I want to say humanity has struggled in its creation-creator relationship or creator-creation relationship. God made this <coughs> relationship essential in this way. Ideally, the creator is the one who creates. He sets the rules. He designs everything for the good of his creation. And creation is best served and will served if the creation follows the way the creator has set things out to be. The problem is the creation says, hey, I don't like the creator. The creation says, you know, I want to do things my way. And guess what? Well, that's how we get all our problems. So I want you to see it is the creator that created the creation, the human beings here. Um, maybe in this picture, the potter designs what the clay is to be like. The clay has no right to tell the potter, you know, how you're to design me. So the first 
truth. It's just, I think, six words here. Um, the Holy Spirit directed Moses to write this very simple statement. As God created the first humans, he created them male and female. He created them. These, these two beings, Adam and Eve, were created by God himself. They are our first origin um, of the human race. Um, <clears throat> if you want to know what race you come from, it's from the race of Adam. It's the Adamic race or the race of Adam. These first two people constitute the race <clears throat> when, in which every human being came from. Um, I'll talk about some good science. Even today, um, scientific geneticists, geneticists have done genetic studies on scientists, and they find that human beings are 99.98% the same. We are the same. We don't, we don't have as many variations as you know, our sin nature wants to call out or our sociology class will call out. And they, they're, they're good at highlighting the differences. And usually all they're talking about is skin color. That's it. Skin color and the degree of skin color, whether light or dark. Um, and some of that has to do with the different adaptation of, in terms of where they lived. Um, they lived in a dark place, their skin is one color. They live in a hot place and sunny, their skin may be another color. But I want you to see that God made male and females. That's it. He didn't make its. He didn't make trans or the right to change your gender. He set out two genders. He designated them male and female, and they work best that way. You put two males together in marriage, it doesn't work well that way. You put two females together, it doesn't work well that way. I want you to see very clearly that God created them and designed them to make men as male and females or women as female. God made Adam and Eve. He did not make Adam and Steve. All right? It's Adam and Eve. It's not Adam and Steve. On both, <clears throat> God made them male and female, and he made them complete, not lacking, not needing evolutionary process. He made them mature. He made them as adults. Um, they didn't have to grow up to be adults. They, they, they didn't go through puberty or childhood or crawling or thumb sucking, that kind of stuff. He made Adam and Eve uh, adults. They didn't have to evolve over many years. And God, God specifically designated, designates their, their gender, and he also defines their gender. Okay? It's not that. None of this intersex stuff, all right? He designed their gender very specifically. And so... Um, I understand in our culture, our culture has a lot it wants to say, and the culture wants to act as if it was a creator and say, hey, you have the right and you have the authority to call and design your own gender. I want you to know that we don't have the right to determine our own gender. We are not God. God is the one who calls that shot. He's the creator, and he's given us the gender that he wanted us to have. And so I don't know how to make this any more clear, but God is the creator, and he's the one that has every right to give us the designated gender. But I do want to hit a couple of things here as I step into this section. Um, as image bearers made in the image of God, um, no matter how big or small the image bearer may be, I hear some people, I've looked in the Guinness Book of World Records, weigh like over a thousand pounds, and that's just really big. They might be a big image bearer. And some human beings these days are in the seven foot range. Supposedly some over the course of history even reach around 10 foot, like Goliath. That's a big image bearer. But let's take smaller image bearers, our two-year-olds, our one-year-olds, those that are in people's wombs, um, nine months pregnant, six months pregnant, Three months pregnant. At the point of conception, you have an image bearer. And to kill this image bearer is to murder. I'll just leave it at that. You can understand the implications there. An image bearer is one who has life. 
and one who bears the image of God at the point of conception. So that's a strong application that addresses something in our culture today. And that's why I keep trying to steer us back to what? The origins found in Genesis. Um, I'm going to give you some bad science, and I want you to see it as bad, and you'll recognize this really quickly. Here's some bad science. There. How many of you have seen this picture? This picture had a different origin with a different intent as I studied this week. But we've seen shirts, logos, bumper stickers with this picture. And this picture was not the original picture, as we'll see. Um, <clears throat> in 1965, The Road to Homo Sapiens was an article that came out from Washington University in St. Louis by Kevin Blake. Um, this, this, Kevin Blake wrote this article on December 17, 2018, looking back on the origin of the March of Progress. And so he sees this picture, and this is where it was initially published. And people look at that and made the previous picture. And the, the graphic is what people usually just think about and know, but they're not reading the bottom. And this is not the original design. This original article was supposed to look like this. Boom. It was a fold out. It was tucked in and it fold out. If you go back to the one, go back one. This is page 42 and 45. If you open it up, you have 43 and 44. So if you, I'm just going to read what's happening in this misunderstanding that, that went out and people caught this image and, and literally believed it for what it was. And it wasn't even the intent of the original author to put it out like this. But Kevin Blake makes this really clear. And this, this, this picture was originally um, written by a guy named Rudolf um, Zollinger. And in Time, Life, Books, Early Man, 1965. Kevin Blake says this about this bigger picture. The timeline, so a quick footnote before I read. When you look at the first two pictures, you think it's this linear, right? Chronological years. It it looks like these animals evolved over a linear process. But Kevin Blank points out as you read the smaller font, and you can hunt this down on your own. He says the following. This was eye-opening to me. I just never knew this. The timeline above the illustration shows that many of the figures, including the first and final five, live contemporaneously. They live at the same time together. Okay, And when you add the timeline and the descriptions, instead of a direct line, the illustration comes up, becomes, a, not, excuse me, the illustration becomes a lineup of several cousins, granduncle, once removed, and some are in there, the great-grandfather. However, the subtitles are overshadowed by the powerful impression made by the illustration, the picture. And so people have taken the picture and think it's this chronological progression of Homo sapiens. But this, if you read the fine print, they say that these creatures all <coughs> existed, or not uh, half of them existed, they believe, even at the same time. And so, um, so the powerful illustration completely lost. It's completely lost when the illustration was used alone. But when popular media, back in those days, encyclopedia, newspaper, captured this, and was proliferated, um, the simplified image became misinterpreted to show and convince people to believe that evolution equals progress. And this was never the intent of this original picture. It blows my mind. But no one has done much to retract this picture and to say it, wasn't, it didn't even meant to be that in the original intent. And, and those others have gone on and ex- exercise more bad science over the year. And then, Gary, I want you to know, I'm just not taking this from my little seminary pie. This is out there. And as I give you three more bad examples, um, the, these bad examples of science, I mean, it's like shame on them that this ever went out. And it's, it's interesting how Satan has used this in many ways. But I'm going to give you three examples. The first one is Pil- Piltdown Man. Basically, in this situation, they took a 
Hum- this, this, I don't know how much detail you want. You can find this all online. It's co- considered British's greatest hoax. In, 12, in 1912, basically a jawbone was found in one place, and further down in the excavation, they found, <coughs> well, they found, excuse me, they found a human skull, and then they took an ape-like jaw, and they put it together. And they wanted to explain the log jaw, and they're just trying to look for, what, in, <coughs> a part a skull that would what? Look like an ape transitioning to a human being. And so they took two separate parts and said it's one skull. Okay? So it went for 40 years. People believe this. It went into all the science magazines until 1913, Piltdown Man was exposed as forgery. Dr. Kenneth, <coughs> Kenneth Oakley showed this and showed that this is a modern human bone and this is a jawbone, and they, it's a jawbone of a, of a, of a orangutan. And they, these people who made up and fabricated this, they actually took the teeth of the jawbone and filed it down to make them look a little bit more human so they could say, hey, look, it looks more like evolutionary process. And, to, and then they went on and, put, and tainted it with some kind of paint to get the, the texture and the color of two different bones to look about the same. I don't know how this makes you feel. In one sense, it's, it makes me mad. It makes me mad that it's still put out there in our textbooks today as truth, as fact, even though in 1953 it was proven to be a fraud. Um, then there's a Lucy, a Lucy fraud. That's another one. Um, you know, if you go in any modern museum... They'll say, they'll, they'll say, hey, this is what Lucy looked like. Um, and she's been the poster child for a long, long time. Supposedly Lucy, according to human secularists, they say was 3.2 million years old when they found the, the, her skeletal remains in 1974 in Hadar, Ethiopia. They found about 40% of her skeleton. And they go, oh man, look at these bones. And what they did later on is they found footprints over a thousand feet away. And they go, oh, these bones must have gone with these footprints. Let's put these human footprints and these baboon bones together and say, look, we got more evolutionary process going on here. Um... No, Lucy is a straight-up gorilla or ape-like creature. The human footprints they found far away, those were human footprints found far, far away. They were never meant to go together, especially if they're found over a 1,000 feet away. This is poor evidence for any kind of transitional parts between amino acids to monkeys to human beings. The last one um, in... February 1928, a gentleman by the name of Harold Cook received this tooth. (laughs) And so he showed it to his buddy, and both of them so wanted to find more transitional human parts. They so wanted to find and prove evolutionary process. They go, well, this tooth, it must have came from some primitive human being. And they literally declared it was a tooth. Um, that was from Nebraska, from the Upper Snake Creeks of Nebraska, and they found this fossil of an anthropoid ape. And it's not even um, from that designation of humanoids or human beings. Really, this tooth was from a what? Does anyone know? I'm looking at Grant because we've talked about these kind of things. This is, from, this is a pig tooth. It's a pig tooth. One little tooth. They fabricated to be a big, big story that it was a transitional part to be a human being. I want you to know that these are three sad stories, and a lot of them are still peddled in our modern textbooks today, not even as theory, but as fact, as truth. The sad reality is... Shame, shame, shame on these people. I I really wish... Well, Christians have. Go to the Creation Museum this summer. It's there. They, they, they debunk all this stuff. Um, you can just go on the website. Um, they, they, some of these, this, for this one, 
The scientists eventually retracted their findings. Good, tip their hat. But next time, do better science before you publish it, you know? Seriously. All right, create a purpose number four. Um, blessed to be blessed. Okay? Um, we see that Adam and Eve were created, and God blessed them. Um, and he, he wants, he blesses them with the idea, I believe, that he wants them to prosper. Um, he wants them to receive God's blessing and to, to bless others. There's more to say there, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I, I will say this much. When it comes to God's blessing, God's blessing works best when you follow God's design and God's creative design for your life. Do you think God blesses when you disobey his creative design? You alter your gender. You do other forms. No, you usually suffer consequences of some kind. And so life is best when you follow the Creator's ways and you enjoy blessing. I'm not saying you live a perfect life because we still live in a fallen world and you just need to understand that reality too. Um, but the general principle, if you follow God's will and His word, you find yourself in a circle of blessing and often goodness and blessing will follow too, according to the Proverbs. Um, <clears throat> created purpose number five, God created to multiply and subdue. Uh, there's a lot here, but Moses said in verse 27, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Um, God called the first couple to be fruitful and multiply. Basically, he's saying what? Have kids, make a lot of babies, procreate. Um, this is God's will um, to make a lot of babies. Uh, I'll throw a footnote in that, on a couple different angles. Um, for young couples, I usually ask them, why do you want to get married? And one of the reasons I'm looking for is we want to have babies because that's God's design for marriage. Um, this biblical. I understand there's <coughs> other exceptions where you may be infertile, and I, I'm very sorry, um, <coughs> and we grieve with you. At the same time, um, I also bring, believe that the Lord has given you the body of Christ where you have opportunity to disciple kids, be a part of the nursery. You can still adopt or foster adopt. I have my friends coming later on in, in May. This talk, they're going to talk about adoption and foster adopting. And so there's ways to be a part of a process of young ones um, and discipling there. But specifically what Moses is talking about here is to have babies, to multiply and to be fruitful. He also says, fill the earth and subdue it. Um, this speaks of proactively ordering and designing the earth so that it would yield riches and accomplishes God's purpose in your daily workplace and how you live. And so that's the idea here, to, be create, to multiply and subdue the earth. Um, lastly, creative purpose number six to, is created to be so and very good. Um, the last part of Genesis chapter 3, verses 30 and, 30 and 31, God created Adam and God created Eve in this amazing way. I didn't say this earlier, but when God created Adam and Eve, you just think male and female, first two human beings. You know, we, we kind of take it for granted. But Adam and Eve, they have full functioning systems. They got digestive organs. They got reproductive organs. They got a nervous system. They got a skeletal system. So much is going on. I mean, if you are taking that anatomy and physiology, you know what that's about. I mean, they got these amazing eyes that are better than any camera that we ever had. Um, they got these brains better than any computer that ever existed, faster, quicker. I don't know. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. We're amazing human beings, and God made that. And he did so, and he said so, and it was so. He didn't say there's evolutionary process or we need more advancement. He says, and it was so. That's it. And on the first six days, he ended every day, and he said it was good. Day six, he says what? Very good. Very, very good when it came to the creation of human beings. And so I'm going to step back and just remind us of God's big picture plan. God made us in his image to display, reflect, and mirror his image. We know in Genesis 2, two chapters later, that sin entered the world God's image is once it's shattered. We live in brokenness, and we see brokenness all throughout the world. But God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live and die. Live the perfect life, die the death we should have, pay the penalty on the cross, 
and by faith in Jesus Christ, guess what? We can be saved, can be acquitted from our sins, can be justified, and guess what? He restores the image of Christ in our lives, and we become image bearers again until one day he takes us home and we are perfected. It goes full circle from Eden to a future paradise. So, three applications, and I want you guys to kick this around a little bit. I want you guys to think really hard and discern and know what you believe. And what you believe, does it come from the Word of God? My goal for myself each week when I preach is to teach the Word of God. I want you to know the truth, and I want the truth of God to set you free. That's my hope. But sometimes I feel like we, we, we have a brain capacity that's been filled with a lot of lies, and so we have confusion. What do I believe? And so you need to go through the process of discerning and reading the book straight for what the book says, not so many contaminants in it. And you might have been a brain that's been filled with a lot of lies for many years, and so it takes a process to work this out. I want you to know I wasn't like this from the get-go. I was telling someone, you know, by the time I got to the church, I'm a full evolutionist, I'm an atheist, I'm agnostic, I, I'm everything that the world wanted me to be, uh, its own product in Satan's domain. It took a long time to work this through and flesh this through, um, day by day, reading God's Word. So that's the first thing. I want you to learn, group, friends, let's discern. Second one, let's delight. Um, there are many things that um, we can find pleasure in, but I want you to know your greatest delight comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He made us for him. Um, if you find yourself addicted into sin, smoking, uh, porn, whatever, the greatest way to beat an addiction is the greater passion, and that's a passion for Jesus Christ. As simple as that. If you want more information, just talk to John Piper or just read his books or website. That's all he talks about over and over, the passion for Christ. Um, and then lastly... Let's think more and more what it looks like, not just to think about this, but to live out and to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of Christ as individuals, but as we come together to display the gospel together more and more. I believe the strongest witness and strongest testimony we can have together is to be a community that what? Loves one another and that reflects the gospel together. Um, I'm a simple man. I try to major on the main things and try to do the main things well. I care about the little things. I'm not sure if I care about every little, little thing, um, but to do well on the main things. And Jesus is really clear about the main things. Love him, love one another. And so as we grow in theology, my hope is that we're not more arrogant, but that we're more loving, that we love each other even though we're different and we may have a different belief system, we come from different backgrounds, but we know we have what? The same origin, the same creator, and he's hammering the same image of Christ in each one of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. This is a lot of heavy stuff that's countercultural, but Father, help us um, to flesh this out more and more in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.